Uh, so my name is Clayton O'Neill. I work with Dave uh, on the OpenStack team at Docker. Um, coworker and I gave a talk in Austin about how we deploy things with Docker. Um, we're a little bit further down the road. I had a little bit more things to share, so I figured I'd put some stuff up here. Um, so as far as we're at, as far as using Docker, um, we have all of our control plane and compute services inside of Docker, so everything you see here. Um, first started doing this about July of last year, and the last of these actually just went in a couple of weeks ago. And uh, it works. We haven't really had any problems with it recently. Um, this works pretty well, um, but it has not always worked perfectly. Uh, one of the biggest problems we had is solved with Docker. Wow, this mic's really hot. Um, one of the biggest problems we had this was solved with Docker 1.12. It used to be that if you uh, upgraded Docker or restarted Docker Engine for some reason, all your containers would restart, which was not ideal. Um, with Neutron, that was a really big problem for us because of um, some of the processes that can run inside of the containers. We really want to keep running around. Um, upgrading to 4.4 kernel also solved a lot of problems. We had a lot of issues with um, AUFS bugs. Um, we were using the 3.13 kernel, one of the newer ones that comes with the Ubuntu Trusty. Um, upgrading to the newer version um, really has made things pretty solid. We haven't had any issues. So the main reason we did this is we don't want to have to upgrade all of our servers at the same time. We don't want to have to update Nova to Mataka because we want to upgrade Keystone to Mataka. We like to do these things in a more staged fashion. Some of these things are less risky than others. Um, the other thing is, is that we want to be able to control exactly what version of a stable release that we're running. So I'll give you an example. We upgraded Cinder to Mataka the other day um, in our first dev environment, and we discovered that none of our solid fire storage worked. Um, and it turned out that was a bug that was already fixed um, in the last couple of weeks since we'd last built our last Docker image. It took us about an hour to build that image and then get it deployed into a new dev environment and verify that the fix worked. So if you're interested in hearing more about this, I'm giving a talk on Thursday. I know it's really late in this thing. Um, and uh, we're gonna be talking, I'm gonna be talking about uh, how we managed to, the tricks that we had to do to get Nova and Neutron to actually work. Um, the talk that we gave at uh, the last summit is kind of a more overview sort of thing, and that's on YouTube. Um, we also have a puppet module that we've put on um, GitHub that is what we use for deploying um, uh, OpenStack services running inside of Docker using Puppet. Um, that might be useful to you, uh, even if you're not using Puppet. I know that I've found the Cola um, repo is really useful because they're doing a lot of the same things. Sometimes just figuring out what the command line flags are is really useful. Um, and that's about it. I'm going to be around all week. If you want to talk about this stuff, if you're doing similar stuff, have any questions, I'd be glad to talk to you. And if you don't catch me this week, feel free to reach out. All right, thank you. Um, go ahead and, oh. I believe we've got, uh, do we have Marcella Porrazzola? Is uh, Alex Lowe here? Okay. We've got a desktop. Is George Maescu here?
So I have a lot of charts, but uh, don't panic because some of the charts are just for you guys to glance and there will be more information um, in other uh, places. I'm going to give some, some times for you guys to get more information about. So uh, I'm, I'm, my name is Marcelo and a part of um, IBM Power Systems. We uh, deploy OpenStack on power hardware. And uh, this part in particular, uh, it's about uh, the operations stack that we're deploying your uh, OpenStack clouds. And uh, it, it, is, it does work on both Intel and Power platforms, so that's why it's uh, relevant for everybody. Um, so that there's more components of the, the uh, or, or, or whole stack. Uh, we, we actually use OpenStack Ansible to deploy OpenStack on, on Power hardware. And then the last part of our stack is, is what I'm going to show here to you guys. So um, uh, when we started looking at uh, the, uh, deploying OpenStack in, in Power and uh, to, uh, how, how to um, actually add value to OpenStack, right? So um, there are three points that we, we try to make. One is, um, um, so uh, OpenStack is, is uh, uh, um, OpenStack manages the cloud resources, but it doesn't do a good work to manage the rest of the infrastructure, like the other uh, services in the operating system, uh, hardware, uh, and uh, believe it or not, uh, OpenStack services themselves. So um, there's, this is uh, slowly changing. There are new projects coming up, uh, like Monasca, but um, up to now, uh, uh, we, we have to complement it using tools like um, uh, Zabbix and Nagios and uh, Sensu and uh, Elkstack. So that's what we, we try to do here. Uh, Multi-platform, I had to have a bullet for that because it, this is tested on power in Intel and uh, it, it works uh, uh, independently on both. And uh, one other point we, we try to address is uh, configuration drift. So um, once you, you add new nodes to your, to your OpenStack cluster, uh, you have to configure those nodes to be uh, for operations as well. So you have to drop more configuration on Agus, you have to drop uh, configuration for the filters for log stash, you have to drop visualizations. So we try to, to address that as well. And here's the uh, architecture. Uh, we, we use Ansible. And there are three levels of uh, playbooks that we use. One is uh, what we call integration playbooks. Then there's the, the core playbooks that uh, deploy the, the actual uh, applications that we use for operations. Like, uh, like I mentioned, we, we start with uh, Nagios and uh, Elkstack, and we use Ansible itself to do the, the deployment of the endpoints. And uh, we, we have a dashboard as well. It's an extension to Horizon. And it's a very simple dashboard. It's just made for um, uh, listing all the hardware resources that we integrate and uh, launching to the other applications, like the Nagios dashboard or the Elk dashboard, right? And uh, uh, there are different uh, deployment scenarios that we, we had to support. Um, so since we deploy on top of OpenStack Ansible, we, we wanted to, to of course, um, support deploying our services together with uh, the controller nodes on OpenStack Ansible. So this is one mode. Uh, we had uh, engagements where we needed to, uh, to have this same kind of uh, architecture, but with no OpenStack. I know it's sacrilege to say that in OpenStack conference, but uh, our cases where uh, we, we don't have OpenStack around. And there are hybrid cases that we use uh, OpenStack Ansible just to deploy some uh, services. For example, we build uh, clusters with uh, Ceph, uh, just Ceph, or, or just Swift standalone. So that's, uh, that's what hybrid means here. And uh, uh, one important point as well is uh, we, we have this concept of uh, ops packages. So um, you, uh, these are bundles of configurations for the applications that integrate. And they, are, they apply for certain scenarios. For, for example, we have uh, bundles that support uh, ma management, and they, they, they kind of define visualizations for Kibana, and they define checks on Agus for, for the, the standard services, for, for the hardware, for the operating systems and services, and you can expand that. 
Uh, then there's the private cloud one that we manage all the OpenStack services that uh, OpenStack Ansible deploys, 20 plus services. Uh, there is one that we, we add Trove on top of OpenStack Ansible. So uh, we use OpenStack Ansible in Mitaka, and uh, Mitaka doesn't have Trove. So another team into IBM, they built a playbook for that. Uh, so now they're adding Trove to, to Newton, right? Or they already did, I guess. Uh, then there's uh, those uh, other scenarios I, I told about uh, uh, Ceph standalone or Swift standalone. So the idea here is that you have those packages and you uh, deploy into, into the stack and you can go, uh, go to the stack and just uh, like say, I want to add a node and the node is uh, type uh, uh, Ceph monitor, for example. And then uh, the, the core detects uh, exactly where the, node, uh, the configuration uh, configuration has to de be deployed to. Uh, there are services that run on the server side and the uh, endpoint side. Uh, so for Nagos, um, not sure if you guys are familiar, but uh, there are very thin agents. Uh, for Nagos, it's called the NRPE. Um, for Elk, uh, we, I, I put a picture of Beaver here, because Beaver is one of the <laughs> log shippers, but there, there are plenty more, right? And for Ansible as SSH. And the idea is to have this uh, extensible by the community, right? So uh, somebody could go and uh, we, we recent, recently we uh, added uh, support for Ganglia. Ganglia is kind of a metric visualization tool. So just add, go there and drop a playbook for the tool that you like. And in theory, it should work <laughs> seamlessly, right? And, and the same uh, thing for, for endpoints. If you want to support like um, a switch, you want to visualize a, a, a Mellanox switch, for example, you could build um, a ops package to manage the Mellanox switch, right? And uh, this is being put in GitHub right now. It's available for sharing. Uh, it's a patch, Apache license. Um, so we're still working on it. We're a small team, just three people <laughs> working for a few months. So don't expect much, but uh, it's, it's evolving, right? And uh, now just to finalize, I know that we are, we are short on time here for lightning talks, but um, just wanted to, um, I will skip that one. Uh, just, this is a kind of a look and feel of the extension we built for Horizon. Just a list of the resources, and then there is a Dropbox, uh, Dropbox with uh, the, the applications that we integrate, so it launches in context to the dashboard for Nagios and the dashboard for, for Kibana, for example. And this is Horizon, this is right there in Horizon. So you can go Horizon, click on the resource you want, click on the tool, and then it uh, goes to, to that tool, right? And uh, some of the packages that we build, I'm not going to go into detail, but um, uh, so they build a lot of uh, visualizations for Kibana, for, for OpenStack itself, for Swift, for Ceph. And Nagus, uh, Nagus we, we actually did three levels of optimization. Um, the communication between server and agent, uh, it's consolidated. So if you have like uh, uh, 20 checks that you want to do between server and agent, it, it just communicates once uh, either way, right? There is a plugin for that for Nagus called the Check Multi. So in your uh, um, playbook, we, we configure that. In OpenStack Ansible, we have the concept of uh, LXC containers for each of the services. So we don't install an RP on each of the LXC containers. We install just the bare metal. And then you have a special plugin that we built and uh, tell, uh, okay, monitor that container for me, right? And uh, it, does, it, it kind of uh, does an LXC attach and runs the checks there and consolidates that and sends back. Um, so uh, all this is good for scalability. You can scale that probably to hundreds and hundreds of uh, nodes, uh, possibly. <laughs> we haven't tested yet, but in theory, right? And there are different uh, uh, checks for Nagus. Here's uh, uh, um, uh, showing a detail of um, check multi. For example, each of those lines that you guys saw in the previous picture, this is a consolidated check. And then if you go to the details, you, you can see all the, the uh, dozen or, or, or more checks that it actually does. And uh, 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 the, the status is consolidated back and uh, showing the main Nagus uh, service uh, interface. 
Uh, here's uh, one check for IPMI sensors. Um, it's uh, re really critical. It's a, a problem we are having into our hardware. <laughs> And there's some, yeah, yeah I'm fi finalizing. So there's some directions. And uh, just uh, to finalize, um, if you guys want to know more, there is going to be a live demo. It's part of the Open Power Summit. And uh, it's going to be Friday, 10, 15 AM, on the Princess Hotel just across the street. And that's what I had. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, that's okay. Uh, I think we have Curtis up next from Interdynamics. Check one, two, all right. Uh, right, so I just have a quick presentation here on ECMP load balancing OpenStack endpoints. Um, I don't know, I've been doing OpenStack for quite a while and sometimes you get to a point where you just wanna do something cool that you've wanted to do for a long time. So I've always disliked uh, virtual IP addresses and all of the, I've used a few different systems in production like UCARP and um, some of the other systems, and I've just never really liked it. And I've always wanted to do uh, ECMP-based load balancing for the uh, for the endpoints. Uh, so in this particular example, I just have a, and unlike probably a lot of people in the room, this is a small lab deployment, but it's a permanent one, and we use it to deploy to test other OpenStack deployments. Uh, so it'll kind of be like a underlying service cloud or under cloud. Uh, there's just three physical servers. Um, a bunch of switches are attached to it because we do some pretty complicated networking stuff. Um, but it's a converged deployment, which is a little weird because I run, so I run the control plane for OpenStack on top of the hypervisors themselves. So there's just the three systems. Um, and I do that using LXC containers. Uh, one of the goals that I have for this little lab is just to try to make it as HA as possible. So if we lose one of the nodes, then everything keeps working, even though it's still just like a little lab deployment, but it was just a goal that I had. Um, so ECMP is equal cost multipath routing. Um, typically when you would use this, you would also include uh, BGP on the nodes so that if you lose the BGP session, then the route is automatically removed from the switch. I'm not doing that right now. That's like a next step for myself. So there's just a script that runs that notices when one of the interface, one of the IPs isn't working and it shuts that interface down. Uh, something that's a, a bit interesting about this deployment is that I'm using uh, edge core switches, which are kind of considered a white box switch. So in this particular example, um, I've got one of the edge core switches that uses an ARM processor and this broad, particular Broadcom switch silicon. Uh, and then the network operating system that's running on it is Cumulus Linux, um, but I'm back on 2.5.7. So one of the problems with this little switch is it's just a very inexpensive one gig, like. 48 port switch and it doesn't really have the features that some of the newer uh, silicon has like the trident and the tomahawk stuff um, so the it doesn't have resilient hashing which is a feature in these newer systems uh, but that's a sort of a next step uh, so this is just a really really ugly diagram of what I have so there's three physical hosts and then a whole bunch of containers are running on each of those and I actually, unfortunately, ended up with two virtual IPs, so you can kind of see all of the IP address spaces that I use. But I guess the main point of this slide is that there's uh, each of the physical hosts, and in particular, the HA proxy node that's running on it, is in a separate uh, IP space and VLAN. And we can kind of see that here in the blue. So my virtual IPs are in the 172.16.11 uh, range. And then you can see that we have three different routes to three different IP addresses, all with the same weight. And they're actually on different VLANs as well. So each one of those corresponds to a different uh, HA proxy. 
And you can also sort of see that in, in the red it describes which uh, IP addresses are there as well and which networks. So inside each of the HA proxy interfaces, it's listening on my two VIPs. Uh, so each, each HA proxy node is listening on those two, the 11.2 and 11.3 interfaces. And then it sends traffic back out through its gateway to the switch again. So uh, some of the things that I have some problems with in this particular design is that the, this particular switch is, is kind of underpowered to do this kind of stuff. Like if I upload a glance image uh, to, uh, to glance, uh, it'll pretty much swamp the entire switch. <laughs> uh, fortunately, we do have a bunch of Edge Core 5712s, which are much more powerful switches in-house. So I'm gonna, when I go back home, I'm gonna put these into, into place. And when I do that, I'll add in BGP. So um, there'll be a BGP agent of some kind running on each HA proxy node. And if it goes down, then that route will get pulled. Uh, and they also, the other thing I have to do is upgrade to a more release, recent uh, Cumulus Linux release. But that's kind of all I had to, to talk about. But um, it's just kind of fun to be able to do stuff in the lab and mess around with new technologies. And yeah. Thank you. OK. Um, I think up next we have, uh, I'm going to massacre his name, George Mahescu from uh, OICR. Is Blue Box in the room for their? And is Alex Lowe in the room? Hello everyone, my name is George Michalsko. I'm from uh, Ontario Science Institute for Cancer Research in uh, Toronto. Uh, we are one of the largest cancer institutes uh, research in the world and uh, of course the largest in Canada. And uh, OSCR uh, supports about 1,700 uh, researchers in Ontario. And it also uh, hosts the Secretariat of the International Cancer Genome Consortium and its Data Coordination Center. ICGC is a research organization created with the goal of um, collecting and al analyzing uh, 500 uh, tumor uh, normal pairs from uh, 50 most common types of cancer. So it's a, it's a large uh, data project. And uh, as you can see on this chart, um, the largest uh, countries in the world participate in this project providing uh, data samples from their cancer patients. So we have uh, coverage for each type of cancer from at least two countries in order to better uh, cover the variety of uh, cancer mutations. The Cancer Genome uh, Collaboratory project that uh, I'm uh, an architect for was uh, created uh, based on a research grant from the government of Ontario and Canada actually in order to provide the 3,000 cores and 10 to 15 petabytes of object storage to store the data collected by ICGC. The problem that the project tries to solve is um, to allow researchers to bring their computational algorithms to the data. Instead of the researchers uh, downloading the data over the internet to their local data centers, uh, taking months to, to do this and having to uh, store this data over and over and again, they can create accounts in collaboratory where the data exists, there is compute capacity, and they can analyze it uh, in, the, in one place. 
the genomics workflows and workloads are different than the regular um, OpenStack workloads. So uh, latency and uh, speed of uh, provisioning is not that is important. What is important is uh, to be able to download the data fast, analyze it, and uh, the VMs that uh, we uh, use are very large VMs, and they uh, totally saturate the um, resources that are allocated. For this reason, over-subscription is not uh, um, something that we enable uh, in a collaboratory. And as you can see, the flavors that we created uh, cater for this type of workflow. So uh, the C1 large, which is a commonly used uh, type of VM, has eight cores, 57 gigs of RAM, and 1.3 terabytes of local storage. Okay? Because when they download the data, uh, we are talking about very large files. And also, it's a very good uh, CPU to memory uh, ratio. Uh, if we look at the high-level architecture that we create in order to accomplish the goal of uh, having 3,000 cores in just 12 racks, in addition to 10 to 15 petabytes of object storage, uh, we decided to use um, high-density compute chassis. So we are talking about two U chassis that have four um, compute nodes. The four compute nodes have 20, 24 drives in front six drives allocated to each compute node. Dual power supplies, uh, each compute node has um, two 10-gig uh, ports. Currently, we are only using one. And um, we also, you'll see in the same rack, we have a storage nodes. For the storage side, we are using high-density high uh, storage chassis, 36 drives. Um, because for the storage node, we allocate four 10-gig ports, okay? We basically use the entire space in the rack, 40 used for uh, compute and storage, and we have two used left top of rack for uh, one gig management switch and one gig, um, uh, one U 10 gig um, switch for production. One of the benefits of uh, mixing compute and storage in the same rack is that um, some of the Nova Cinder traffic stays local. So, uh, as you'll see later, object storage is the main uh, use case for this environment, but we also uh, have a small pool of uh, cinder volume, which means that uh, researchers can create volumes, attach them, and store data persistently, in which case uh, the traffic between the compute node and the storage uh, cluster, some of it, the primary replica traffic, would be local to the, to the rack. Also, the power uh, draw is uh, lowered by uh, having storage and compute. If we had to just put compute in the rack at this density, we definitely need three, four 60 amp circuits. Right now, we have two 60 amp circuits per rack, uh, and we have uh, um, around 40 amps drawn from both circuits, 20 and 20. So if one circuit fails, the other circuit left, uh, which is a 60 amp circuit with a PDU of 48 amps rated, basically has enough power to um, feed um, all the power. This is uh, again a diagram of the rack. So you can see uh, we have at the top two 1U uh, switches, and then we have eight U's for the compute. 16 compute nodes in eight U's, and then we have 32 U's allocated to eight storage nodes. What this gives us, uh, if we use 10 core CPUs, uh, about 640 CPUs per rack and about 2.3 petabytes, uh, we started with four terabyte drives and then we moved into six terabyte drives, and last week we added uh, eight terabyte drives, okay? So the, the racks have different uh, weights, depending on when we uh, uh, loaded the hardware. We had multiple uh, purchases. On the uh, OpenStack controller side, we have a pretty standard HA architecture, um, because again, this is a um, research environment. The SLA is uh, a little bit more relaxed than a regular uh, commercial uh, OpenStack uh, environment, but we still um, have uh, MySQL uh, replicated, triple repli replicated uh, RabbitMQ uh, clustered, uh, HAProxy doing SSL termination, keep alive the uh, taking care of the private and the public VIPs. Um, 
we have on the control nodes we used SSD drives and we created three RAID controllers. One controller allocated to the operating system and CEPHMON. So CEPHMON also runs on the controllers, um, but they have 128 gigs of RAM and uh, 24 uh, hyper-threaded cores. Uh, the second container is allocated to uh, MySQL, dedicated, and the third one for MongoDB. Uh, we use GRE for uh, tunnels because um, this is uh, about two years old environment and GRE was more stable and still has very good performance. Uh, we have four uh, 10 gig interfaces for the storage, for the controllers. Um, we are using uh, an active, active configuration for the bonding um, and use the layer 3 plus 4 hashing for better link utilization. On the compute nodes, so we use uh, two CPU sockets, so these uh, micro servers four in the chassis, they have uh, eight or 10 cores, they said 256 gigs of RAM, again, uh, very uh, good capacity, local storage capacity, so six to terabytes in a RAID 10, uh, SAS disks uh, gives us about 5.3 terabytes. Um, Usually, rich searchers start uh, a number of VMs, large VMs, so we have three, four, five VMs per compute node. They share these uh, six uh, drives in a RAID 10, so we have a good IOPS uh, performance. A lot of capacity, if one VM does, uh, is at a step where it hammers the disk, it only affects other VMs running on that uh, compute node. It doesn't affect uh, the entire environment also smaller uh, failure domains. We don't do live migration. Um, these VMs are basically ephemeral. If a compute node dies, then uh, one workflow uh, will have to be restarted somewhere else. Uh, it's a pure cloud uh, environment. And it's not uh, feasible to actually do live migration for VMs that have 50 gigs of RAM changing and 1.3 terabytes of attached disk that has to be moved. Uh, on the self side, we have uh, three MON servers running on the controllers. We have 10 Rados Gateway instances. So each uh, controller runs two instances of Rados Gateway on different ports, load balanced by HA proxy. Um, and we have um, four other instances running on uh, um, some storage nodes in the other racks. Uh, we started with Hammer, uh, actually we started with Giant and then moved to Hammer. We used triple replicated pools. As I said, most of the space is used to store um, large uh, um, cancer genomic uh, data files. But we also use uh, the self pools for uh, Cinder and Glans. Uh, we made some tunings to the um, uh, Redus Gateway in terms of stripe size. So. Um, when we upload the data, the large files, we have a special client that we use to up do the upload, and uh, it's, it up does multi-part upload in one gigabyte uh, chunks, which then is split by uh, the Rados gateway into 64 megabyte Rados blocks. This um, uh, basically um, lowers the number of Rados objects in the pool. So we have uh, Cinder Volumes uh, pool, which has more objects than uh, the Rados Gateway buckets pool, although it's 10 to 1 um, date usage. Uh, the self OSD nodes, we said 36 um, drives. Uh, we have uh, 12 core CPUs. Uh, I know it's a lot, but in case of uh, rebalancing, uh, they are used. Plus, if we want to move in the future to um, other types of like erasure coding or um, it's good to have um, faster CPUs. We use 280 gig uh, SSDs uh, hot swappable in the back of the chassis uh, in RAID 1 for the OS. Uh, the LSI um, controller has uh, eight uh, 12, 12 gig uh, bits per second channels. Um, and we have four 10 gigabit uh, NICs on the server. We bond them two for self-public and two for the replication, active, active. Um, on the networking side, the top of rack switches are brocade. Um, the main uh, production switch is the 7750 that has 48 10 gigabit ports downstream and 640 ups, upstream. 
and it has a stacking functionality that allows you to basically connect three ports, three Twinux cables to the rack to the left and three to the right. And basically you have um, two to one over subscription ratio. This is the client that we uh, created uh, to do the uploads and to um, limit uh, data access. In terms of software, we of course use uh, Ansible, Zabbix, Grafana, Elasticsearch, Rally. We started about 5,000 instances in the last three months. Uh, this is uh, only stored 500 terabytes of uh, objects in, in CEF, which is 1.3 petabytes triple replicated. This is the screenshot from the last week's rally test. Uh, we were able to have 800 simultaneous workers starting one instance. So um, we are downloading uh, during a load test about 28 gigabits per second. We are actually limited by how fast the VMs can save the data they download from Radus Gateway. Uh, this is a screenshot from rebalancing traffic last week. As you can see, 14 gigabits per second on the self replication, so 10 gigabits wouldn't have been enough. So it's been saturated. CPU, as you can see, the all nodes are on top. They are not uh, very uh, CPU uh, bottlenecked. The nodes on the bottom are the nodes that uh, receive data, and they were about 50% used, but the yellow is I.O. weight, so even if you give it more CPU, it's not going to actually use it because it depends on the disk. Memory, not an issue during rebalancing. Uh, as you can see, the data was uh, being drained from the old nodes and loaded to the new nodes, about 400 terabytes of data that were, uh, was loaded to the new uh, storage nodes. I hope saturated, and uh, I'd like to thank uh, our funders for uh, providing um, funds for this project and the government of Ontario. Yeah. Thank you. Paul from Blue Box. Oh, IBM, Blue Box, an IBM company, something like that. Is uh, Hiroki Ito here? Uh, just a, a quick announcement. So we're at the end of the first session. We're just going to keep going through the break. There's like a 10-minute break here. Feel free to get up and leave if you've got another session. And then we'll wrap up with uh, two more speakers now. Or soon. <laughs> All right, so this is going to be a short version of a talk I gave at uh, OpenStack Seattle Day uh, with my, one of my coworkers. So I work at Blue Box. Uh, it is an IBM company. I am legally obligated to tell you that. Uh, and my team doesn't actually work on OpenStack itself. We work on a, on a, on a project called Site Controller, uh, which is kind of everything else required to install OpenStack in a data center. So here's some stuff about us. Uh, you, don't really need, you don't really care about Blue Box itself. So Ursula is our Ansible-based automation for deploying OpenStack. Uh, it's very similar to uh, OpenStack for Ansible. Uh, it's just a little bit older, and it's very opinionated for uh, Blue Box. Uh, and, and it is open source, if you want to look at it. Uh, and then we also have a tool called GiftWrap, which builds OpenStack packages. Uh, basically, we give it a, uh, a manifest that looks like this, which tells it which OpenStack projects we want, uh, what uh, versions, and what any extra dependencies and stuff. It builds a bunch of packages, uploads them to Package Cloud, and then we re-download them to our mirrors. So yeah, Site Controller is kind of everything we, we want to, we need to install OpenStack and operate OpenStack in our and our customer data centers. Um, before we had Site Controller, we only really had two, da two data centers, and so it was pretty simple to run a couple of Elk servers, some Pixie boot infrastructure, etc. Um, but then, as we were acquired by IBM, and also we started taking on customer data centers, uh, that 
uh, sort of change things. So Site Controller came about when we had a first a customer that said, can you install this locally for me? By the way, you don't have any internet access, go. Uh, and so I kind of sat in a room uh, by myself for a week and kind of threw together a uh, proof of concept of this. Uh, it's basically a bunch of Ansible to install uh, all the bits we need. Uh, and, uh, and so it's basically the initial bootstrapping, so IPMI, being able to do Pixie installs, making sure it doesn't have to reach out to the internet, so having mirrors of everything. Um, we were even mirroring uh, Git repos and all sorts of stuff, which we don't do as much anymore. Uh, and also all of our logging and monitoring and stuff. The only thing we were allowed egress for was uh, sent to pager duties, because they were super, they were happy for us to be woken up at three o'clock in the morning. They were cool with that. Um, uh, we made it work. Uh, so for Pixie Server, we actually tried a bunch of stuff. Uh, Razor and uh, Cobbler and a bunch of other stuff and realized that all we were trying to do is here's a MAC address, give me a Linux and DNS mask is actually really good at that and is really simple so we used that. Uh, we tried a bunch of apt mirrors and we had a lot of issues with repo repo and stuff like that when there were like non Ubuntu mirrors as far as like the upstream uh, rabbit and stuff like that. They didn't quite conform to the standards and some of the tools were very strict, whereas app mirror just goes, just grab stuff and it works. Um, and then app repos, same thing, we had a lot of issues, so we're like, we'll just use uh, package cloud and then we'll just mirror down from package cloud. So we don't really uh, download stuff from package cloud, we just put it up there to be our sort of source of truth and so we just treat, them, treat, treat our own repo like, a, like uh, an, uh, any other external repo. Uh, and then uh, the other ones are important is uh, for Python, we use DevPy, and for, uh, um, for Ruby, we use uh, Gemini Box, and we have Varnish sitting in front of those because they work really well on a laptop, but they don't really work when you have hundreds of uh, machines trying to use them. Uh, and then we have just a generic file mirror, which is the virtual host on, uh, on Apache. We've got Proxy, we've got the Elk stack, we've got Sensu, et cetera. Uh, and when, when, as we were bought by IBM, suddenly we went from a couple of data centers to uh, over 30 data centers. And so we're like, how are we going to handle this? How are we going to make it so we can quickly deploy in multiple data centers? And we decided we were going to split site controller up and have a, a remote site controller and a central site controller. And, uh, and the central one would be kind of the, any time a person needs to access a, any OpenStack node, they would go through the central thing. So if it's SSH or accessing Kibana or accessing uh, um, uh, Sensu or anything like that, um, they, they come through to the central site controller and it kind of takes care of them accessing all, all the uh, bits at the remote data centers. Uh, and they're all connected together via IPsec tethers. Uh, and this is kind of what it looks like. So you can see we have the, uh, up on the, the left we have the uh, central site controller with all of our mirrors and, and our, uh, set, our uh, Flapjack server, uh, Elk and stuff like that. And then we have uh, the, the remote site controller which is kind of a smaller subset. And so at each remote data center we have, it has its own Sensu server, it has its own Elk stack. Some of that is because at customer installs they want to keep their data local. Some of it is just so we don't have like massive, massive Elasticsearch clusters. Um, and then the Apache uh, at the central site controller takes care of virtual hosts so like from one dashboard, you, you, you're accessing Sensu at any of the data centers, you're accessing uh, uh, Elk at any of the data centers, et cetera. Um, that doesn't matter. So we have a Bastion server, uh, obviously it's SSH, and of course we're Ansible, so we run all of our Ansible stuff from there. Uh, we do two-factor auth with YubiKeys, um, and we have a, a project there for helping us with that. And then we have this thing called SSH auth proxy, and what it does is it fakes being a SSH uh, agent and allows you to share an SSH key with a user when they, without them ever actually seeing that SSH key. And so that allows us to say, they log in, they're a member of a certain group, so they get a particular uh, key injected into their SSH agent. And so they can then go and access you know, customer X's OpenStack, or they can access a site controller, or whatever roles they have uh, available to them. And that actually works really well. Uh, and then we have a thing called TTY Spy, which is basically uh, doing, uh, uh, doing script pipe to curl X post. Um, and it does it with a bunch of sockets and some magic. 
Uh, it's not open source, uh, but there's a project pretty similar to it that I've linked there. Uh, and then we have IPsec tethering to everything. Um, so from, local, from the central site controller, we tether to each of the remote site controllers. And if they're in soft layer, which is our data centers, we then tether to uh, each of the, remote, the open stacks. And if it's local, then they just have a direct LAN connection to the open stack. And so for all these services, Sensu, uh, Elk, et cetera, uh, in Ursula, there are places where we just dump our environmental settings for site controllers Elk server in that data center or site controllers Sensu server in that uh, data center. And it sort of loosely couples itself together and, uh, and that's how we get stuff across. And we have a control proxy which uh, OAuths back to our uh, central uh, 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 inventory management tool uh, which is called Box Panel um, and then has reverse proxies for everything. So if I was accessing the Kibana in the Barcelona data center, I would go to, go to that URL and it would uh, bring me that uh, Kibana. Um, and everything is wrapped inside Ansible. We, we have a kind of a general rule. If you can't automate it, we don't run it. And so this is an example of what it looks like when I'm setting up the OpenID proxy, sorry, the, the proxy in, uh, in the central site controller. I give it a bunch of locations, the, the actual location for it that I want to proxy to and the URL that I want to uh, proxy for it and it uh, builds out all the Apache virtual hosts and stuff to do that for me. And then it ends up with this, and so you click on any of those data centers and access their dashboards. Um, oh yeah, that's, uh, you wouldn't download OpenStack. Uh, and so we have a bunch of mirrors. Uh, I kind of talked about that. It's pretty straightforward. Again, it's all driven by Ansible and it's all data driven. So I have a list of files that I want to download and put on the mirror so that the OpenStack installer can access them. I do it like this. I can just grab them from a URL or grab them from uh, Swift. Uh, same with apt mirrors. I get a list of mirrors I want and a bunch of OSs I want to mirror. And it goes and builds up the apt mirror config files and runs apt mirror and downloads and mirrors everything. Uh, IPMI, so we try not to use it too much. When we have to, we try and use the IPMI tool uh, and use serial on, serial on LAN. Uh, very occasionally, we have to use the actual IPMI GUI. And so we have a, a IPMI proxy, which is actually a little web app uh, that knows about all of the servers and their IPMI addresses. And it creates a, a, NAT, a NAT just for your IP to, through it across the IPsec tether to the uh, IPMI uh, uh, card you're trying to access. And uh, it's kind of dirty, but it's easier than trying to push um, uh, tunnel like IPMI through uh, SSH or something because there's a lot of UDP and stuff happening on the remote console version. Uh, and so yeah, Pixie, we tried a bunch of stuff. Turned out if we, if we tell Ansible about every machine's uh, MAC address and like four or five other things, it's really easy to generate a, uh, a Pixie boot file and a Ubuntu pre-seed. And so that's what we do. Uh, and it, uh, we used to use Razor, we use this now and it, it actually simplifies our life a lot. Uh, and again, this is what it looks like. We say, hey, here's the DHCP range you're going to pixie boot for. Here's the mirrors, the pa any extra packages we want, passwords, and the list of servers. And so as long as it's got a name and a MAC address and the IPMI, it'll, it'll, it'll be able to connect. It'll IPMI to it, say, uh, next boot, boot from pixie, now restart, and then it'll restart. It'll find the pixie server. It'll find the files. It will then install Ubuntu. And we don't do anything apart from like installing the um, VLAN packages and a couple of things that Ubuntu doesn't ship with so that uh, we can get it working uh, at, the, at the, that Pixie boot and then we do everything um, via Ursula when we're actually installing OpenStack. Uh, and the other thing with this is we have what we call a mini bootstrapper, which is either a VM on your laptop or it's a little Intel NUC, which is, which is this role again but only for the initial Pixie boot server. So I can just rock up to a data center with my laptop with running Vagrant or uh, Intel NUC that's already been Ansible. And I just plug it in. I restart the Pixie boot server. It'll Pixie boot off this, get, get itself all set up, connect up to the IPsec tether, and then it will then be able to Pixie boot uh, all the other machines from it. Um, for monitoring, uh, so because we, we have a lot of uh, customer data centers that don't want internet access, uh, we wanted to try and get it to go th flow through our IPsec tethers. And so to do that, um, we had to put Flapjack in there, which sits 
centrally, and so the Sensu server at the remote data center gets an alert, uh, it, it tags it with uh, a couple of things, and then it sends it up to Flapjack server, and the Flapjack server then either forwards it to PagerDuty or email or to, to wherever else it needs to send it. And that works pretty well, although Flapjack seems to be a fairly stagnant project, so I don't know uh, if we're sticking with it long term, but it's kind of what we have. Uh, this is what our monitoring flow looks like. Uh, it looks more complicated up there than it really is. Uh, logging's a pretty similar story. On each of our uh, OpenStack nodes, we have the Logstash forwarder. Um, we've got FileBeat um, is, is coming in, and we're depreciating uh, Logstash forwarder. It talks to our ELK servers via the Lumberjack protocol and just does round robin DNS to our ELK servers to decide which one to send it to. Our ELK servers are kind of a, uh, we, ha we you know, start with two or three, and every server has Elasticsearch, Logstash, and Kibana on it. And so every time we add, we add more, we just get a little bit of extra redundancy and via the round robin DNS, we don't have to worry too much about pointing at servers and stuff. Uh, and the Lumberjack protocol's pretty good. Um, we have a fair bit of filtering, Grok filtering, and then we also archive up to, uh, we, were, we were trying to archive to Swift, so we had to keep like set seven or 30 or whatever days of uh, logs live on the Elasticsearch servers, but the Swift backup driver uh, was unmaintained, so we're actually backing up to uh, S3 object storage right there, and no, I should say an S3 compatible object storage um, for uh, logs backups. And that's kind of what our flows look like. Again, it's actually simpler than it looks in that diagram. Uh, and that is it. Thank you very much. <laughs> Our next uh, speaker is Ito Hiroki from uh, Japan. <laughs> Introduce yourself, please. Is Alex Lowe in the room? Hi. Oh, hi, I'm Hirokito from NTT. And now I'm operating the private cloud for it, uh, which is the uh, kind of a test bed for developers in my department. And today I'm going to talk about our security audit world stories concerning about collecting NAT logs from the virtual routers. And first, I'd like to, uh, I, uh, I like, I start with uh, how this story begins. And recently, our department, uh, have been enhancing the security audit rules. And one day, the security manager announced that the correct NAT logs from the or virtual machine from your uh, private cloud. And you should, uh, uh, every internet connection should be trans traceable in case of a security, security, uh, security incident. And at first, I, I thought that this work is very easy because Neutron has some good features or something to uh, concern, concern with this. However, I realized that Neutron doesn't support the correcting NAT logs, so we have to uh, we have to find find good way to uh, collect NAT logs from virtual routers. So what is, what should we do exactly? The, there are the two works. First, we have to collect information about local IP allocations for each 
virtual machine. And the second, we have to collect NAT logs from the virtual routers. And here, first job is relatively easy because we can use this, we can use the notifications. And we can collect uh, local IP allocations from the novel compute, novel compute process, uh, no notifications of the novel compute process. However, the second work is a little bit complicated because uh, these uh, virtual routers are dynamically created, so we have to deal with it. And today, I'm going to talk about second topic. So I'm wondering what is a good way to find uh, virtual, uh, not logs from virtual routers. But soon after, the good so uh, cool solution came down from the sky. I mean, the ops mail. And the it, in this topic, the how, the, uh, how to correct not logs from virtual routers are discussed. And yeah, that was a very perfect timing. And the basic idea here, uh, we use the ulogd software, and it is uh, which can be correct a net filter or IP tables related logs. Of course, uh, of course, including NAT logs. And there are three steps in uh, this method. Uh, as you know, Neutron use uh, IP, IP command to create network namespace. So First, we, when Neutron use, use, uh, use IP command, uh, then we start uh, ulogd in that namespace. And second, and we start logging not, uh, not the connections using ulogd and uh, send, send the log information to the appropriate uh, logging servers. And when the, some network namespace is deleted. When we kill ulogd, ulogd process running in that namespace. And this is the uh, detail of the our method. And we use uh, neutron root wrap filters to automate start uh, automate to start uh, ulogd process. And in the, uh, each net, net, uh, each root wrap filters uh, com confiles, we have to replace the original IP command to use to use IP root wrap, IP wrapper script, which we create, which we created. And in IP wrapper script, there there are uh, there is a if branch. And if Neutron use IP command to create some network namespace, we uh, first we start uh, <coughs> uh, we create that namespace. Then we start a ulogd process in that namespace. And if we Neutron use IP command to delete uh, some network namespace, then first I stop ulogd process in that namespace. Then I'll de we'll delete that namespace. And with this method, we can collect the NAT log. And this is the example of the NAT log. And this log, in, uh, this log uh, have, has every, uh, all information to, uh, to know, to find out uh, the each, each virtual machine's uh, network connections. However, there is a problem. And the next day I, we achieved this, we found out that that not, not, uh, not information doesn't log in the log, uh, log files. And it, look like, it looks like uh, this happened after log rotation. So what is the problem? And we found out that uh, we have to change the log rotation options like this because the original script of the log rotation, we, uh, we only uh, send sig signals to the uh, log, U log demo in the host, neto host, neto uh, host network namespace. However, we, uh, as I mentioned earlier, I, uh, I, 
I'm running the ulogd processes in all network namespaces. So we have to send we have to send a sig hub signal to all uh, all ulogd daemons in every network namespace. So we have to uh, replace the original one to the red line, like red lines. And with these works, we can finally correct, com uh, finally complete the mission. However, there are a huge logs, so we have to deal with it. And this is the, this is, maybe this is our next work. So after our work is never over, I think. And that's all. Thank you. Thank you. So we are, have completed the scheduled uh, lightning talks. Um, if someone has a lightning talk they're desperately wanting to give right now, uh, I'll entertain one or two of those. Otherwise, I think we're dismissed. Speak quickly. All right, thank you for your participation and thank you for your attention.